right, if you guys want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, we are continuing in our sermon series through Peter. Um, we're going to be in verse 13 to 21. I'm going to turn there in your Bibles. This is Peter, the Apostle Peter, the head of the twelve disciples. He's writing to the church that is in modern-day Turkey, on the western side of modern-day Turkey, to the persecuted church in all that region. He's calling them elect exiles, so they are elect of God, set apart in this world, but exiles set apart by God in this world, and because of that, exiles in this world. This is not their native land, this is not their home, exiles in this world, but chosen of God, chosen foreigners of God. And that's what we've worked through, and and we have sort of um, navigated that identity that we have, all of us, as elect exiles. And today we're going to kind of apply that. How, how then shall we live? And, and to get in that, I just want to follow up briefly about how I started my sermon last week. If you heard last week, I discussed the greatest thing I'd ever eaten in my life, and that was cheeseburger hash at the Portland Harbor Hotel on April 23rd, 2016. I remember that because it was the day after my wedding, okay? Um, that day, Hannah and I, we were excited because we were uh, going on our honeymoon. We're going on our trip to Montreal, and we got married in April. And so, you know, we're up here in April, so it's still cold in New England, and so you're not going to really go anywhere uh, like the beach unless you're going to travel um, to someplace down south or someplace away. And we did not have any money because we were married and poor and, and weren't going to spend money. It, there's actually a decision. A decision was made, okay? And I am still trying to get over this. You can either spend money on the wedding or you can spend money on the honeymoon. And uh, I want to spend what the money on the wedding. Hannah, I'm sorry, I want to spend money on the honeymoon. Hannah wanted to spend the money on the wedding. So guess which one we spent our money on, okay? It was not the honeymoon. So we had to make the honeymoon happen. And so what we decided to do is we decided to go to Canada. Why not? Seemed to be a good choice. And go to Montreal. It was far enough away, but not too far. And everything was in French. And so it felt like a different country. It was a different country, but it really felt like a different country because everything was in French, okay? So we spend our week in Montreal. We have a great time in Montreal, do all the sights and the sounds and all that. We drive back to Gorham, we make it to our apartment, and then reality sets in, okay? I've been waiting all this time to get married. I'm finally married. We have our honeymoon. We get back. We, you know, get back to the apartment. We pull in in and and unpack the, the car, and we drop our luggage down, and I'm married. Now what? Now what do I do, right? I'm a husband now, and I'm a stepdad. And that was a little different because we were like instant family. I mean, I guess you're a family, you know, married, like just husband and wife, but you, with the kid thrown in there, it's like instant, instant family. I've been neither of those before. Now what? I said I do. Now how do I do what I said I do? It's a new reality, and i got to figure out how to live. That's been something I've been thinking on as we've gone through First Peter. He's been given us this new identity, elect exiles, again, chosen by God. That's what we've been exploring. But now what? Now what? What do elect exiles do? How do you live in this world that is not your home? How do you live in this world that you are a foreigner in, in a world that is antagonistic against you often for what you believe, how do you live as a stranger in a strange world for God? How do we keep moving forward? That's what we're going to think about today as we go through these verses, verse 13 to 21. How then shall we live? 
And so let's read in verse 13, going to verse 21. Peter says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Uh, what a word, what a word, and what instruction that we get. And that starts right in verse 13, that is our first point. How then shall we live? How do elect exiles live in this world? Well, the first thing we see is that they set their hope. Verse 13, set their hope. Let's explore this. You were called to set your hope. Well, the first obvious question, set your hope on what? On what are you setting your hope? If you go up to verse 13, you see it clearly stated. We're going to come back to the first half and spend our time in the middle to the end. It says, set your hope fully on the grace. Set your hope fully on the grace. So that's what we're setting our hope on. Now, what is the grace? We're going to get there. But first, I want to give you a quick definition of Christian hope. Because this is something that we need. I want to make sure we're defining our terms and we're understanding what the word means as God wants us to. <coughs> Christian hope... Christian hope is a, or the word hope, is a word we throw around a lot, okay? And there's a worldly sense that we mean hope, and then there's a Christian sense that we mean hope, a biblical sense. In a worldly sense, we might say, I hope it doesn't rain. And if I had hoped it didn't rain on Sundays, I would have been disappointed today and last Sunday, because that's all it's done. It's rained. There's a hope of this world where we hope because the end is in doubt, because maybe it will rain. We hope because we're not sure what the end result will be. But the Christian understanding of hope, biblical hope, does not operate in that way. Christian hope operates from a position not of doubt or chance, but from a position of certainty. Uh, we hope in things that are certain, things that will happen, not in things that may happen. And so with that in mind, go back to the text and read it. The second half of verse 13, he says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. You see that? Not the grace that may be brought to you, but the grace that will be brought to you. So that's an assurance. You will have grace. Now, if you remember earlier in 1 Peter, in verse 3, we were giving the grounding of our hope. Why is our hope so certain? Well, he told us in verse 3 this. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So why do I have certainty that my hope will be vindicated? Well, the reason why Peter tells us is because Jesus is alive. That's why we have a living hope. That's what he says. My, dead, my hope is not dead, it is living because my Christ is not dead. He's alive. And I love that. As Christians... We don't have a, a pie-in-the-sky optimism. We don't have to look on the sunny side. We don't have sort of these feel-good desires that things will turn out good in the end. 
No, we have an empty tomb, right? We point to an empty tomb. My hope is as certain as the tomb is empty. And it is empty because Jesus is not there. He's risen from the dead. That's the grounding of our hope. That's why it's a living hope. So I am hoping in a grace, going back to verse 13, that I will receive. You will receive grace. The other aspect of this is that it is a future grace. My hope is certain in a certain grace, but also a future grace, a grace that will be brought to you. And then the question is, okay, when will it be brought? And he tells us, it will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is this? What is this revelation of Jesus Christ? This is his return. I've been struck as we've gone through 1 Peter so far how much he focuses on the return of Jesus as a source of hope. He's fixing their eyes on the day to come. Set your hope on the gracious return of Christ. He's saying to these exiles that this is what you need to bring before you in your sojourning. The path of faith no matter how difficult it is, always ends with Christ. That's why if you want anything other than Christ, you will be very, very disappointed whenever you get to heaven. It is all about Jesus. This is the third time this chapter he's pointed their eyes to Christ's return. He did it in verse 5, he did it in verse 7, and now he does it again in verse 13. And he's doing this because this is really a source of comfort for these people, as it should be for us. But I just wonder, how often are you looking forward to the return of Jesus as a source of comfort and hope? Whenever you're really in it, whenever you're really struggling, or just in general, are you looking forward to that day of Christ's return? And I want to give a little distinction. We look forward to heaven, but this is specifically Christ's return, okay? This is His coming back to this earth to gather up the church to be with Him. And there's a little bit, that's basically the same thing, but there's a little bit of a distinction there. These people lived with an eager expectation that they would see Jesus in their lifetime. Now, we know that that didn't happen because he still hasn't come back. But I wonder, do you have an eager expectation? Do you have that? Does the return of Christ feel imminent to you? Or does it feel distant? How are we to consider that? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. It's really interesting. How are we to view it? Well, we know no one knows whenever Jesus will return. But still, how does Scripture want us to consider this return? I think the Bible gives us some instruction here. This is how the Bible ends. It's very interesting. The very end. Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says... Surely, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So when is Jesus coming back? Well, the Bible tells us. It's soon. It's been soon for 2,000 years. That doesn't make it any less soon. Jesus is coming back soon. This word soon is used throughout the New Testament throughout the New Testament, but never more in the book of Revelation. How interesting is that? The last book uses this word soon six times, three times in the final chapter. I am coming soon. And it doesn't mean immediately. It doesn't mean tomorrow. It doesn't mean next week. That word soon means without a necessary delay. Jesus is coming soon. He's on His way. He was not distracted. He was not hampered. He was not kept back. He is not delaying. He is ready, and He is coming soon. And so Peter says, you need to set your hope on this. Your Lord will not delay in coming back to you. He will not delay. This is what we are setting our hope on. This is given to you as a comfort, and what it really does is it changes the perspective of how you live your life. If you really believe that Jesus is coming soon, then you're going to make the most of this life. 
You're not going to waste this life. You're going to be about his business in this life. It's like people who are, you know, given that diagnosis and only have a few, you know, weeks or months to live. That really brings perspective, and so they really start doing the things that matter. I think that's why we need this aspect in our lives, because then we're going to do the things that matter. Importantly, not only does Peter tell us the object of our hope, but he tells us how we set our hope. And this is, again, how are we to live? He tells us how we are to set our hope. And it's interesting if you read it, verse 13. He says, therefore, and the therefore is uh, bringing, uh, applying, bringing everything he said about their status as exiles. This is who you are. Therefore, because of this, you are to prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded, okay? So this hope that we are setting, how we go about setting that hope is maybe a little bit more involved than you might have thought otherwise. Preparing your mind for action set your hope. That's interesting. Sober-minded sets your hope. There is effort here. This is not naive optimism. The phrase there, preparing your mind for action, is literally gird up the loins of your mind. I highly doubt any of you have told anyone else to gird up their loins, okay? If you did, that's kind of weird. Better to say prepare your mind for action. It's a bit of a mixed metaphor. At the time, the fashion, the people of the time, they wore long flowing robes, long flowing garments. And so if you were ready to get down to work, if you were ready to get down to business, you'd you know, bring in your robe and tuck it in your belt to free up your legs so that you could move and movement would not be impeded. You were girding up your loins, getting ready. Uh, we might say you were rolling up your shirt sleeves. Along with this, Peter instructs them to sober-mindedness. Literally, this is um, your mind being free of the effects of alcohol or drugs or, or those types of things. And I think that's there as well. But I think more to the point, mastering your emotions self-control, thinking clearly, okay? The point is that setting our hope on Christ actually takes some effort. It actually takes some effort. It's not as easy as I'm going to just saying that because the world, it's easy to forget our hope. It takes some resolve saying, I will hope in Christ, I will hope in Christ, no matter what is going on in my life, I will believe this word, because you are going to be in situations that seem hopeless. Uh, You may not be thinking straight. You may be wrapped up in a world of emotion and distress. You may be downcast in heart. You may be spiritually weak, where you are just saying things you know you're supposed to say because you're a Christian, but not actually believing them. He's talking about the daily battle of the mind to believe. And, and that's what we all have to embrace. There is a daily battle every single morning to believe the words that God has given us. A daily battle to not get distracted, to see all these things happening to you, and to not be swayed. And, and I think, more to the point, even whenever life is going well, or whenever life is just regular, which is what life generally is, regular, okay? To not be distracted. Our hope's still there in Christ. Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. And what I'm saying is, this takes some real effort. Uh, you got to roll up your sleeves. And yet at the same time, I love how empowering this verse is. It calls us to get it on our feet, to stand tall, and to believe courageously. To believe courageously. Not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is how elect exiles live. They believe courageously. They set their hope 
They have a strong resolve and a strong desire. They are of sound mind. They think clearly. And not only that, they understand and can perceive whenever they're not thinking clearly, which is paradoxically a sign of thinking clearly. I'm not in a good spot right now. I'm not going to do anything rashly. I'm going to go back to the word, Jesus help me to set my hope. That's the first thing I see here in verse 13. Elect exiles, they set their hope. The second thing that we're going to spend more time on is they live holy lives. They live holy lives. I'm just going to read verse 14 to 17 again. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He's quoting from Leviticus there. And if you call him his father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So here, Peter addresses us, important not to miss this, as obedient children. This is the context of our holy living. We live after the life of our father. What a, what a, um, a beautiful thing to see a child imitate their father, assuming the father is worthy of being imitated. Um, that's what I see. I, I see Levi, and this is his mother, but he says things that Hannah says all the time. Um, all these little phrases. Hannah, is, if you know Hannah, she has all these little mom phrases, and uh, it kind of rubs off on Levi, and she start, he starts speaking like her. Um, the kids imitate the parents. The children imitate the father. Obedience is within the context of a loving father-child relationship. If you are in Christ, you are now His child, you are part of the family, and because our God is holy, we are called to imitate His holiness. Now, let's talk about this word holiness. We're going to just hit on it real quick, because this is a very big topic. That God is holy is the most foundational aspect of his character. It's what makes him God. He's holy. Okay, well, what does that word holy mean? At its root, the word holy means to be set apart. That means that there's nothing like God. He is set apart. You can't, you can look around and get ideas of God, but there's nothing that's going to be like him. There's nothing in the universe that is fully him. The only thing in the universe that was fully Him was Christ Jesus. That's it. He is morally perfect, and everything God does is perfect, and every aspect of His character is perfect. And so holy is really a way to describe everything about God. What I mean is this. God is loving, and His love is holy. It's a set-apart love. There's no other love like His love. That's what it means, set apart. His wrath is holy. His wisdom is holy. His kindness is holy. Whereas we love imperfectly, He loves perfectly. And so if we want to know what perfect love is, we can't look around here. We have to look at Him. There's no mixture of sin or error within Him. 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light and in Him there's no darkness at all. And so what this means, because God is holy and set apart, the more you get an idea of who God is, the more you understand how unholy you are. That's why it's no good when trying to talk to someone about their sin. The context is that it's sin because the God that made them is holy. Without that reference, we don't understand sin. Without understanding that God is holy, we don't understand what imperfection is without understanding what perfection is. It's like whenever we bought our house, we thought it was great. And then the home inspector came, right? I was like, look at this beautiful house. And then the inspector guy says, okay, here's the write-up. And he gives us like a 50-page write-up of everything that's wrong in our house. We thought our house was good. But compared to perfection, it's not. So that's the ground, that's the basis. God is holy. You were called to be that. Now, does anyone feel burdened yet? 
perfect, right? It's like, what? How can I be perfect? I can't be perfect. How? We'll get there. Don't, don't leave. We'll get there. He says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Whenever Jesus came, there was a decisive change, okay? And it's as real as your birth. It's more real than your birth. Before Jesus came, you were ignorant. Ignant, as they say down south. Ignant. You didn't know God. You didn't know the things of God. You were living in sin, and you didn't think anything of it. I remember sitting down with people and people interested in in Jesus and talking to them and talking to them about sin and just asking them about their lives. And I was like, you know, and they would tell me things they do, and I'm like, you shouldn't do that. And they say, oh, is that bad? Is that bad? We were talking to a guy, and he wanted to follow Jesus, and I said, well, it means you can't sleep with your girlfriend anymore. He's like, is that bad? They didn't know. You don't know. You're dead. Sin wasn't sin to you because you didn't know God, and therefore you didn't know your sin. And not only that, not only was that your former ignorance, but you craved that. The passions of your former ignorance. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And honestly, that's probably not a a good way to put it because maybe your sins are much more boring than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Maybe your sins are more tame than that. Maybe you are content to live your life as you see fit, devoid of any acknowledgement or recognition of the God that not only gave you the life that you have, but has sustained you every single day, every good thing including the things you take for granted, the very breath in your lungs. Maybe your sins are not sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but living in blissful ignorance of a God that's worthy of all your glory, honor, and praise. There you go again, presuming upon His grace every day, living your life as if He never existed. What a tragedy. And what an irony. To be perfectly content to live your life without the God of that life. You were dead. Uh, the former ignorance. But then you changed, right? There was a decisive moment. And this is the moment of salvation. And there's no amount of cajoling on the part of the pastor. There's no amount of anything anyone outside can do. It happens in God's sovereignty through the stirring of your spirit. He made you alive. He uses preaching in the church and all this. And, but then he comes in that moment, he, he makes you alive. He called you out of darkness. It says, Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. The course that you followed was the world. You were living dead. You were a spiritual zombie, walking dead, following the course of the world. But then verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, the cause of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. That's the decisive change. Out of the casket, out of the grave, out of the ground, new life in Jesus. And Peter's saying, if that's true, why are you going back to your old life? Don't be conformed to the world that you were saved out of. Don't be conformed to those ignorant passions. It's, you're not ignorant anymore. You know. You have the Word. You've been saved. Don't be conformed to those things. Don't go back to those things. Elect exiles have a clear understanding of what they've been saved from because they're not ignorant. They see it. They know the holiness of God. They see the sin that it was. They know what they've been saved from and they also know what they've been saved to. And yet... Given all of that, and how amazing this salvation is, how decisive it is from death to life, and yet conformity to our past lives is such a temptation that Peter must instruct them to beware of it. Pursue holiness. You are of your Father in heaven. Be like Him. Verse 15 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Elect exiles, they pursue holiness. And they do it because they've been called by a holy God. And this touches every aspect of their lives. Remember, set apart. You are set apart. All aspects of your lives are set apart. Your marriage is holy. It's set apart. Your parenting, if you've got kids, it's holy. Your finances, how you do with your money, all your conduct, your thoughts, your work, everything, it's all set apart. What it means, I'm going to do what God wants me to do because I'm His. And what it also means is if that you're claiming Christ, you need to go in and think about all aspects. Am I conforming to my former ignorance? If your marriage is jacked up, we've got to work on that. If your parenting is jacked up, we've got to work on that. If you're a bad steward with your money, those are just the examples on the top of my head. All aspects. You are conforming to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, this talk on holiness is a burdensome talk. And we're going to find how he ends it that's going to bring it kind of full center. So I just want to acknowledge that. I think this is why a lot of times people um, maybe don't think about these things as much as they ought to. But the teaching is clear. We pursue holiness. In verse 17, he even doubles down a little bit. He says this, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. He's expanding the view. Pursuit of holiness is within the context of a child-father relationship. We saw that. Be obedient children. But now he's calling this father a judge. So we see, if you call on him as father who judges, in a world that is anti-judgment, right, that, that the worst thing you can do is judge someone. To view God as a judge, as a righteous judge, is just so difficult uh, for people, Right? where people will falsely comfort themselves by saying that only God can judge me. And whenever people say that, I say, yeah, He will. That is not a comforting thought. He will judge the whole world. He will judge them according to what they have done. And He will do it impartially. He doesn't grade on a curve. Acts 17, 31, this is Paul speaking to the Athenians. These Athenians are not Jews, they're Gentiles, they're pagan in every way, and he's not afraid. He says in Acts 17, 31, that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who is that man? It's Jesus. So God will judge the world through Christ. And I don't know if you have read what the Bible says about what happens whenever Jesus returns, it is a day of judgment. This is something we, we don't like to look at because we, in the, we're so influenced by the world in this. To judge is the worst thing. Biblically speaking, no. God has rendered His judgments, and all we are here to do is say, look, this is what the Word says, and plead with people to turn. In this context, it's the church, though, okay? Let me say that. It's the church, it's the church. But if you read what the Bible says about that day that Jesus comes back, for the church, it's the greatest day. For those outside the church, it's the worst day. I mean, really read it. And it comes through Christ. He came as the Savior the first time. Whenever He comes the second time, He comes as the one through whom God will judge the world. That's what it says. In light of God's judgment, how then ought we to conduct ourselves? What does Peter say? He says, with fear, till the time of your exile. 
Okay? So how does that work? With fear, now there's a lot of teaching. We're, we're hitting on holiness, we're hitting on fear. These are big things, but you might read that and think, you know, God loves me. Why should I be afraid of him? It can be a little disorienting. And indeed, God does love you. Uh, the Bible sees no incompatibility between love of God and fear of God. Let me say that. There's no incompatibility here. Peter's instruction is that their time in exile should be marked by godly fear. This is reverent fear of your father. This is reverent fear of your father. Whenever I have to get on to my kids, there is a reverent fear there. And you know what? They listen to me. Not all the time. You know, 7 out of 10 ain't bad. I'll take it. Right? There's a fear there. And I see it in their eyes. And let me just say, whenever I get into my kids, for as much as I discipline them, I try to make sure I triple the care and love that I give to them afterwards. And I feel like that's how God is with us. And that's just what I see. As much, and we're going to get to the discipline piece, but as much as the discipline and the fear to be there, so much more the love and the care of God is too. The fear we should have is a godly fear. It's a reverent fear of a God that judges every sin, that holds every deed accountable. This is why Jesus is important. It's not that God sweeps your sins on the rug. It's that who will be accountable for it? Will it be you or will Jesus be the one? It's not that punishment does not come. It's who will take it. Will it be you or will it be Christ? God is telling you, do not presume upon his grace by saying Jesus has died for my sin and so I can sin left and right. On the contrary, Hebrews 12 verse 5 says this about God's discipline. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Whenever God is disciplining you, don't think little of it. Nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. Whenever we rightly understand the fear of God, we know it's not a fear of condemnation. He will not condemn us. Who is to condemn? There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It's not a fear of wrath. The wrath has already come upon Christ. We aren't enemies of God. We're His children. So it's a fear of discipline. That the Father will discipline. If you continue in sin, God will discipline you. But even there, there's grace. Continuing on, Hebrews 12, verse 10, speaking of earthly fathers, he says this, For they discipline us for a short time, as seemed best to them, and you'll see how it connects, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. Discipline leads us to holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And I love that because it gets us to the same point. The fear of God gets you to holiness. The discipline of God, whenever the fear of God isn't present, gets you to holiness. Both lead you to holy living. And so with that, I just... Take stock of yourselves. In your time of exile, are you living a holy life? Can people look at how you live and get an idea of God's holiness? Is your life markedly different because you know Christ? And can people see that? I remember Alex was sharing me recently that he was at a party and some guy was asking him, what's different about you? are you this, are you that? He said, no, no, no. And then the guy said, oh, no. You're not a Christian, are you? (laughs) He's like, yeah, guilty as charged. That's funny, but I think that's a great point. Um, Protect your ego there, Alex, okay, too. Uh, Not that you have one. It should be obvious. You should see it. Now, are you perfect? No. But if you are his, you will be drawn towards his holiness. Again, either through reverent fear or fatherly discipline, you're going to be drawn to His holiness. And you'll find that as you are set apart, you're going to lose the taste of the the former ignorant passions uh, that you had. 
Sin that was once appealing is just not appealing anymore. You're being set apart. You're being made holy. It's not a drudgery. It's not a burden. It can be burdensome. Again, discipline, that's good. But then you just want it more. And not only that, you'll find victory over sins in your life. That's the Holy Spirit. I know God has taken things from me that I had struggled with. I don't struggle with it anymore. I know a lady in, in my past church, she was addicted to heroin. She became saved, and she never had a taste for it again. Done. A- addiction gone. That's not how it was for everybody, okay? I mean, reading a, a story, or a, a pastor, maybe C.S. Lewis or someone, talking about two men saved, both alcoholics, one walks by the pub, thinks nothing of it the rest of his life. The second one walks by the pub, struggles, but never goes in. God gives what we need for our sanctification. It looks different, but the pursuit is the same. The pursuit of holiness. But that's hard too, right? It's hard. It's difficult. Especially where we live and just in this world to believe the things that God has called us to believe, and then to stand on those things, again, exile, strange, weird, odd. If you preach these things and call people to the holiness of God, you're going to get some pushback. Preaching the sacredness of marriage and gender and life, the world's not going to agree with you on that. Again, that is what is setting you apart. That's baked into it. That's externally, but internally, we still have to live with ourselves in the sense that there's still the battle of the flesh, temptations around us, indwelling sin. And so this leads us to the final thing. Elect exiles, they set their hope on Christ, they live holy lives to Jesus, and then they remember the gospel. Elect exiles preach themselves, preach to themselves the gospel. Peter says this in 18 through 21. We're just going to do verse 18 and 19, but I'll read the whole bit. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And he goes on, this Jesus was foreknown. This was always the plan of God before the foundation of the world. But now you get to see it. He was made manifest in the last days for your sake. This is like the second or third time he's used that, for your sake. Talking about the prophets earlier in other passages, now God has manifested Christ for your sake. And now you, through him, are believers in God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. This talk of holiness, it can get us down because, again, as I look at how amazing God is, I think about how messed up I am, how fallen I am. And let me just speak a quick word. If you aren't careful, that can become accusation. Accusation is not of God, okay? He does not accuse you. He cannot accuse you because you are innocent, because the gavel has come down on Christ and not you. There is no condemnation. You cannot be accused. You are ransom and redeemer we're going to look at, but I just want to say that. Be careful of accusation. Satan accuses, not God. And that's why this ending is so important. He's saying, be holy as I am holy, remember the gospel. Be holy as I am holy, remember that God has saved you. You've got to hold both of those. He's urging us towards holiness, knowing that you, he says, were ransomed. And I just want to see that, knowing, okay? You know this. Be holy as I am holy, and yet also know this, that you were ransomed, okay? Let's look look at this word, ransom. The word ransomed means the freeing of a slave through payment, okay? We might think of, um, you know, paying a ransom, someone who's held hostage and paying a ransom. But in this time, it's a slave. The manumission of a slave. So you are a slave to an owner, and someone comes and, and makes that payment so that you're no longer a slave and you're set free. And so in context, if we were ransomed, what does that mean? It means that you were a slave. We were ransomed. I was a slave. And he tells us what we were slaves to. Knowing that you were ransomed, 
from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. This was what we were slaves to. You were slaves to futility. You were living in an, an empty and meaningless life. That's what futility is. You were exercising in accomplishing nothing of eternal significance, engrossed, what we read earlier, in the passions of your former ignorance. Uh, this is all we knew. Again, we were dead in our sins. This is what we inherited, the feudal ways inherited. So not only were you dead, but you came from a dead family, and from their dead family, and from their dead family. Again, in sin. Generations and generations of tradition and influence apart from God. This could be from society. This is wherever. Futility from an eternal perspective. What does Jesus say? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? We were slaves and descendants of slaves. The whole world fell. But then something happened. We were ransomed. We were slaves, but we were ransomed. We were bought. Who then bought us? Well, it tells us we were bought not with the perishable things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. How deep the slavery went and how amazing the purchase was. How precious the blood. This reminds me of Peter with the lame beggar in Acts chapter 3. The beggar is asking Peter, help me, help me, help me. Peter says, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The background here in the Greco-Roman time period, whenever a slave was ransomed, that slave could deposit money in the treasury of a pagan temple. So the money is put in the temple, and then the priests or whoever from the temple could then use that money in the temple and pay the slaveholder to buy that slave's freedom. So now that slave is freed from their old master, but in the eyes of society... That person is now seen as slave to the God of that temple. And so what Peter is saying in a paradoxical way is this, that you have been set free by Christ to be slaves to Christ. Romans 6, but now that you've been set free from sin and have, and have become slaves to God. And so this helps us understand the calling that you have as one who is redeemed. You're set free from futility. You're set free from what you are, have inherited, but called you to a new master and called you to a new king, called you to a new Lord, called you to, new, to, you to a new God. And consider the new inheritance. You inherited futility from your forefathers, but now you remember what was the inheritance we get now? Verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. For those who have been, de been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, they have cast off an inheritance of futility and received an um, imperishable inheritance kept in heaven for you. Elect exiles, they know how great their salvation is. As they pursue holiness and they mess up and they mess up and they mess up, they remember the gospel. I'm not perfect, but my Christ is. They remember that they have been bought with a price, that their lives are not their own. I live for my master. I no longer walk in futility. I have a greater and better inheritance. I don't need the silver and gold of this world. I have something much more precious I have the blood of the Lamb. And it's that blood, it's that Christ, it's that sacrifice who's the grounding of the hope that I'm setting my hope in and the goal of my holiness. There it is. It's all connected. 
And so as we end, I just want to encourage you, elect exile. Don't forget the gospel. Don't forget the gospel. Living this life is hard enough as it is. You have something offered to you that's far greater than the riches of this world. You have something offered to you that's so much more incredible, a greater inheritance that you can store up for yourself treasures here on earth, but you're not going to keep it. The one kept for those who know Christ is unfading, guarded. Along with this, your past doesn't matter. Whatever ways you inherited, wherever you came from, whoever your forefathers were, the former passions of the ignorant life, none of that matters anymore. You've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Remember that as you live your lives in this exile, elect to God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. It's a good word, a challenging word, an encouraging word. I want to pray for those here. Maybe we need to be made more aware of our exile status. Maybe we're not living holy lives and we're not sticking out as much as we ought to be. I pray for your conviction, your discipline, God. I, I pray that you would, that there would be a reverent fear. But on top of that, with that, I pray that we would also not forget the gospel. How could we? It's how we've been saved. It's the greatest thing. There's nothing that compares. And so for everyone here, I pray for an encouragement in their spirit today. I pray for a sober-mindedness, what Peter said, to think clearly and to honestly assess, where am I? And in that assessment, not to be led to accusation and condemnation, but to be led to the cross where full pardon is given and encouragement to continue to live for our Father. We have a hope living because you have risen. We thank you, Lord, and again, we pray these things in that name of Christ and bring ourselves to you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.